Hi there, can I help you folks? Yeah, uh, my daughter's looking for a car that goes with her personality. I love it! Dad, this is the car. Uh, did you, hang, hang on a second, Meg. What can you tell me about this one? Oh, that's just an old tank I use for those commercials where I declare war on high prices. Uh, yeah, 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 hang on there, Slick. Now I see your game. Now I demand you tell me more about this tank. Did I mention the tank is a MVT? Sold. This video is sponsored by NordVPN, the 2018 best VPN for your personal online information and history. Check out the link in the description box for 75% off a special cyber deal. More on that later. British tank designs in World War II sit in a weird area as far as historical discussion goes. They're often vehemently defended, but often not looked into to the same extent as many other countries' designs when discussing the war in Europe. And I believe the reason for this is due to them feeling fairly average, with a lot of them being almost extremely capable, but being held back by intentional design that is highly influenced by doctrine, which is fairly different from the other three big nations in the European war that were more deeply influenced by industrial or grand strategic needs. The construction of the tank, even by British standards at that time, and that's not saying much. Before you start commenting, let me explain myself. In my opinion, for all intents and purposes, the British are the pioneers of the tank. And I know that's a fairly controversial subject, and you can pull all sorts of designs from earlier time periods that weren't developed and focus on who came up with the concept. You could argue the French, as they developed at similar times and created the first conventional tank layout with the FT, but the British were the first ones to shoot at anybody with a tank, so for that, they're first in my book. And with this development in World War I, they began thinking of ways to best use it. Their new ideas were set to be rolled out in full in the offensives of 1919. Unfortunately though, or more likely fortunately, guess it just depends on how you look at it, the war ended before this took place. But the basic idea stayed with the British military afterwards. That being that you would have two types of tanks working together in an assault. Infantry tanks that were heavier and slower to break holes in the enemy line, and lighter, faster cruiser tanks to then go through these holes and exploit the breakthroughs, causing problems behind the enemy lines. In the 1920s, the British experimented with this and very much committed to this military doctrine. You see this reflected in their tank design and what ultimately makes them so mediocre in the eyes of many. Now, the British went through a lot of designs before they settled on some of their better ones. A few, such as the Vickers 6-ton, although not adopted by the British Army, were exported to other countries or heavily influenced designs. The infantry tanks are typically what people think of when they picture British tanks of World War II, especially in North Africa, including both Matilda variants and the Churchill. For what it's worth, the Matilda 2 and Churchill were excellent designs. The Matilda had very strong armor, an excellent crew layout, and the two-pounder gun that it and many other British tanks were armed with was a very effective anti-tank gun in the early part of the war. In France in 1940, a group of Matildas counterattacked some of Rommel's forces, causing a panic as the Germans couldn't figure out how to kill them and nearly caused a retreat. They were also very effective at many points in the North Africa campaign, earning its title the Queen of the Desert, and it was the only tank, besides the Sherman, used on all three major fronts of the entire war, also being used by the Soviets and in Southeast Asia. The Churchill remained in service throughout the whole war and shared many of the same key features, becoming the most survivable tank of the war thanks to its armor, and being able to have its gun upgraded due to a large larger and later on upgraded turret. The cruiser tanks were slightly less successful, but still not bad. Although having reliability problems more often, the Crusader designs were well liked by their crews when they worked and had some impressive top speeds in their later variants. <laughs> So the tanks themselves were not awful. Their drawbacks, such as slow speed for the infantry tanks and thin armor for the cruiser tanks, were consciously made design choices, and armaments for the most part were very effective as the models were being created and were upgraded whenever possible. The problem with British tanks is that the design philosophy for their intended use and the industrial base that created them ran headlong into reality once the war began proper. British planners had a hard time embracing combined arms warfare, but unlike the Japanese who wrote it off out of poor understanding and later refusal to use it, it, General Haig in World War I seemed to grasp the concept fairly solidly, mentioning that the new forces of mechanization would not be of any use without the other arms of the military. But between 1918 and the early North Africa campaigns, this seems to have been lost, resulting in some ridiculous tank losses in battles, most often against well-placed German anti-tank gun positions. Because the tanks would often go in relatively unsupported to these attacks, the Germans could often pick them off fairly easily using their 88s on the heavier tanks and other anti-tank weapons along with their tanks to 
take out the cruisers. The effect of this was compounded by the rather poor production system the British had in place. Unlike many of the countries in the war that attempted to standardize as many parts in their war industry as possible, such as the United States and the Soviet Union, the British tank designs often shared absolutely nothing in common with each other outside of maybe the gun, with different engines, suspension systems, and types of armor being used. That limited the number of tanks able to be produced as they're all so different, which is strange because the opposite is true for the RAF. They standardized a lot in their aircraft manufacturing. Luckily, the Americans joined the war just in time and provided tanks for the British before the conflict hit its disaster point. And I know that sounds jingoistic and I can hear the angry British comments already. And there were other factors such as a change in command and a change in tactics. But as far as tanks go, the M3 Lee was designed and rushed out as a stopgap and given to the British and proved vital. Also, the first consignments of Sherman tanks were literally ripped out of the hands of the US tank divisions training with them to be sent overseas. So although I cringe somewhat at that statement too, given the evidence, I think it's a fairly honest representation of what happened, at least on the armor side of things. And this is where the assessment of British vehicles begins to get a little muddy, as the British continued to use American vehicles heavily for the remainder of the war. However, the British did continue to innovate and design on their own models and improve on the American models as well, creating conversions of the Lee into the Grant that eliminated the Radio Man, improving the ergonomics of the tank, and the conversion of the Sherman to a Firefly, adding a 17-pounder gun that eventually became one of the more famous Sherman variants in the war. Although I don't think it's the best one, as the gun breach was so comically large for the turret, it really affected the fighting capability of the tank with very poor ergonomics inside. What's up? 17 pounder won't fit. Put it in sideways. The radio won't fit. Put a hole in the back and have it stick out the back. The engine's no good. Get five car engines and put them together. It was also attempt number two of three to successfully put a 17 pounder in a tank. The previous being the Archer, whatever that was supposed to be. The third one we'll talk about in a minute. The British continued developing their own tanks, roughly keeping to their doctrine and fitting the American vehicles in where they thought they should, i.e. treating the Sherman as a cruiser tank and Stewart's as reconnaissance vehicles. Eventually designing and producing the next cruiser tank, the Cromwell. This is a fan favorite, but suffered in performance from its long development time being designed in 1942 and seeing battle in 1944 that made it fairly outclassed in its debut, and some mechanical problems that plagued it in its earlier runs. The thing was very fast though, and was used quite effectively as a scouting vehicle. And it's towards the end of the war that the British began to get this idea of a universal tank, as the Sherman was for the Americans and the T-34 was the Soviets. And although they were fairly late to the concept, they're really the first ones to knock it out of the park and forge the main battle tank idea. Bullshit. Bullshit. Derivative. That I love, I absolutely love. The first of these was the Comet, the final and in my opinion, first practical move to put a 17 pounder on a tank, since you actually had space for it in this one. This tank saw the very end of the war and although it lacked sloping armor, something that was pretty much universal at this point, it proved very capable and the first step in the right direction. But the British end the war with the Centurion, a very well put together all around tank and the first real main battle tank. Although missing World War II, it saw use in Korea and numerable other conflicts in the decades to come and had an extremely long service life. With all this said, I don't really know where this leaves us with British tanks. None of the designs that were used heavily are really particularly bad, with the exception of a sole few, which will happen with any country. They performed their job well when they were in their role, it's just that the Second World War wasn't what the British predicted and what they planned for. And as a result, their designs, save for the last few, were very kind of... Eh. So I'm not sure that there's a big statement to be made about this country's tanks, but more rather that the war you find yourself in may or may not be the war you planned for, and to be careful where you specialize because you could spend all your effort in the wrong area. I hope this video is worth the wait since the best tank of World War II video way back in... Oh Jesus, that was a long time ago. When I first started seeing requests to talk about British tanks, but I'm interested to know what your thoughts are as well. And let me know down below. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. NordVPN is the world's leading VPN and the winner of the 2018 Best VPN by VPN Monitor. I know there's a million of these things out here and it's good to go with an accredited one. It works on any device that needs protecting with double data encryption for increased anonymity. It runs from an easy to use and lightweight Chrome extension that starts working immediately and with unlimited bandwidth and over 4,800 servers. It even comes with a bonus ad blocker. It runs on most operating systems and comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. Use my link in the description box and the code word Potential History for 75% off NordVPN, only $2.99 a month. Plus, you get an additional month free. Thank you to all my patrons, especially those at the $5 and $10 levels whose names you'll see here on the screen. Without you guys, none of this would be possible. Thank you to everyone for watching. The next video in this series will be on the German tanks, and I hope to see you all there.